Hello and welcome back to Gateway to Oddity. Today we're going to be talking about the No Notoriety Initiative, mass shootings and whether there is a solution that is a little bit less political than the ones we're familiar with uh, in terms of those talking points. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to get straight into it. So on July 20th, 2012, Tom Tevez gets a phone call in the early hours of the morning while he was on vacation in Hawaii with his wife, Karen. It's his son's girlfriend, Amanda, and she's frantic. Tom's son, Alex Tevez, had been shot in a mass shooting at a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado. Tom and his wife, Karen, turn on the news. They're absolutely desperate to hear any news of their son, but all they see is pictures and coverage of the man who shot their son. Hours and hours of coverage, and those hours turn into weeks. And everywhere they turn, they can see the face, the eyes of the man that stole their son from them. No mentions of the heroic actions of Alex Tevez. That night, he saved his girlfriend Amanda's life and unfortunately had to sacrifice his own. How many times have we been faced with these same set of circumstances? After a mass shooting, we hear about the perpetrator and their motivations and their family background and the types of guns they use, where they got the guns. According to Tom and Karen Tevez, too many times. They say that every single mass shooter has one thing in common, the desperation for notoriety. Even the man who shot their son recognised that he could make no impact on the world, but he could become famous through acts of violence. This echoes similar sentiments and statements from other shooters. The shooter who committed the attack in the Pulse nightclub shooting even stopped during his massacre to call a news station. So Tom and Karen started the No Notoriety Initiative, which sets out some guidelines for the coverage of future shootings. These include reporting only on the facts, minimising the names and images of the shooters unless they are still at large, limiting the use of the shooter's name to once per article and no use of their photographs in prominent places like for example, on the front page of a newspaper or in the thumbnail of the um, social media post. They also say that we should refuse to publish any self-serving material created by the shooters. For example, videotapes, diaries, manifestos, things like that. The American Psychiatric Association supports the initiative. The Prime Minister of New Zealand also called for no notoriety after the Christchurch shooting. Now, let me tell you why this is so important. 24 hour news coverage of a shooting that focuses on a shooter increases the likelihood of a copycat attack in the next three weeks. Now, of course, we can't have a conversation about mass shootings without discussing Columbine. Now, this has long been an area of macabre interest to me. I watch hours of documentaries, I've poured over case documents and schematics, blueprints, even crime scene photographs. I've read books on the case and I've even spoken to and conferred with people who are considered experts. So a brief outline of the case for those of you who aren't aware. In 1999, two high school seniors, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, attempted to bomb their high school, Columbine High School. The bombs failed um, and then the killers entered the school with guns and they committed a mass shooting. This killed 12 students and one teacher and then ultimately they turned the guns on themselves. So if you've ever like looked into the case in any way, you might have heard about the basement tapes. The basement tapes were videotapes recorded by the killers in the time like leading up to the crimes. 
They were never released in full, ironically, because enforcement agencies were worried that this would increase the notoriety of the shooters. But they were transcribed, and much of the transcripts is available online. I'm going to read you a brief excerpt from the uh, basement tape transcript. The killers are discussing a movie being made about their crimes. So it says, they talk about how they want movies to be made about their story. Eric says he wants the film to have a lot of foreshadowing and dramatic irony. He mentions a poem he wrote where he imagined himself as a bullet. Klebold, directors will be fighting over this story. I know we're going to have followers because we're so fucking godlike. We're not exactly human. We have human bodies, but we've evolved into one step above you. Fucking human shit. We actually have fucking self-awareness. The boys then discuss whether Steven Spielberg or Quentin Tarantino should direct the film. So, the point I am trying to drive home here is they knew that they would become infamous. Eric even mentions in the in this section of the transcripts, we're going to kickstart a revolution. And unfortunately, they absolutely did. Not just in their pop culture and counterculture influence, but their inspiration to other shooters. There is a graph compiled by Peter Langman. The first point on the graph is Columbine. Each line that comes from that is a shooter who was inspired by the Columbine massacre. Some of those inspired others, and so on, and so on. The ripples of this massacre really do stretch wide and deeper than we could ever imagine. So now I've presented you with the No Notoriety Initiative, I want to introduce you to someone who strongly opposes it, Randy Brown. Brief explanation of Randy Brown for the uninitiated. He actually knew the shooters. His son Brooks was tenuously friends with both of them. Randy has been heavily invested in the case for the past 23 years and has even written a book about it, spoken about it multiple times, different events. He's been heavily involved with many online forums where the case is discussed. And this is how I came to interact with Randy. So I posted in a Columbine researcher forum about the No Notoriety Initiative after I'd seen the TED Talk by Tom Tevez. I won't read you the post in full, but I basically just summarised the aims of the initiative and asked the community what they thought about it. And this sparked a very healthy and lively discussion and debate in the comments. And then Randy came in with a slightly different approach. And I'm going to read you some of what he said to me, or replied with to this post. Quote, there was a war a few years ago. The guy who essentially was for, responsible for that war took his country, located in Europe, on to create a world war that killed a few hundred million people. He was about five feet eight tall and had a weird moustache. Some people described him as a megalomaniac, but he was actually supported by his fellow countrymen. We are not allowed to mention his name or the country he was from. But the devastation he caused ruined, mi ruined millions of lives. He also killed millions of innocent people because of their religious beliefs. We are, of course, not allowed to mention those that religion or the man or woman who was responsible for this war, as it might encourage other megalomaniacs to try and do the same thing. It's not in the history books or written down anywhere. So I'm unsure how to even discuss and have a conversation about or the lessons we could learn if we could have a detailed discussion about his history and the motivating causes and factors. Oh, well, that is history. 
What a ridiculous idea. If you want to stop school shootings and revenge killers, you need to face the tragedy and sadness head on, looking at every single causative factor until you find a way to stop them. Randy continues this comment by explaining his personal views and beliefs about the motivation of the Columbine killers, which is not something we're going to go into right now. Um, but yeah, you get the vibe of the comment. So I responded by saying, Hi Randy, I totally understand your point and I thank you for your contribution. I just wonder if those two guys that killed 13 innocent people and then themselves would look less appealing on a future killer's manifesto than Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, or Reb and Vodka, as they self-titled nicknamed themselves. The exchange with Randy continued, him responding, Killer A and Killer B, which one is Killer A? At this point, I may have lost my patience a little bit. <laughs> And my response was, nobody is suggesting a prohibition on naming shooters. The suggestion is a reduction in 24-hour news coverage, a reduction in the mention of the names of the killers, a reduction of images of the killers splashed across every front page, and minimal publication of materials created by the shooters such as journals and videotapes. This is not an extreme move, such as you are characterising. This is a shift in narrative. Randy and I never really spoke much after this interaction, but to be honest, after watching that incredibly powerful TED talk by Tom Tevez about his initiative and his son Alex's life and death, I've honestly mostly stayed away from these kinds of communities and environments online I don't want to make someone famous even in my own head who committed atrocities to be famous anyway as we can see from Randy's initial comment he and many others believe that continuing to look at journals and tapes and poetry of the killers is the best way to prevent school shootings in the future. As I've hopefully shown in this video, the data simply disagrees. Anecdotally, I can even tell you, I have spoken with a great many number of people about this case over the years, even people who have become enamored with the shooters, whether they admire them for the massacre they committed or they fall in love with the now deceased murderers, believing that if only they would have met Eric or Dylan, they could have changed them, they could have saved those people's lives. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on in relation to this case on the internet. But these people, the, the, the women, the young women, who fall in love with the shooters seem particularly enamored with one particular piece of documentation Dylan Klebold's diary he uses this incredibly flowery language and it's all written in cursive and it's all very like purple prose and it's got these little doodles in the corners and in the diary he describes his incredibly warped view on the world and humanity and love in the most verbose and pseudo intellectual writing style I've ever read like you literally when I've read this document before I struggle to read it because I'm trying to not roll my eyes the entire time it's pathetic um but Apparently it's catnip to mentally ill teenage girls. One young woman, Sol Pace, was enamored by the killers and actually flew from Miami to Colorado. She made online threats towards high schools in the area, bought a gun and wandered off into the wilderness. 
she was found naked having taken her own life. Fortunately, Sol Pace never hurt anyone but herself. But as we can see from Langman's graph, a great many people in her position absolutely do go on to hurt others. Would that graph look different if Columbine hadn't been given the notoriety that it has? If the media follows the protocols set out in the No Notoriety Initiative, could we reduce the number of mass shootings? If this is true, that the only common factor in the minds of mass shooters is the desire for notoriety, then surely it's worth a try. Refusing to give them that notoriety could go a really long way. Media outlets in the modern age make money through clicks and shares and views. If you support this initiative, then it's important to communicate that to the media companies by refusing to click and share and view articles that do not meet the criteria set out by the initiative. So I'm going to go through those criteria with you one more time. Reporting only on the facts minimize the use of names and images of the shooters unless they are still at large, M limit the use of the shooter's names to once per article, no pictures in prominent places, refuse to publish self-serving material created by the shooters. So what do we learn from all this? I personally just want to say again like how incredible I think Tom Tevez and Karen Tevez are as humans like I cannot imagine the pain and the tragedy that they've been through and yet they've turned it around and they've decided to try and stop these things or prevent them or reduce them in just such a unique way that like nobody's really been having this conversation for a really long time and and I think that's really important <laughs> As someone who makes videos like this and talks about all these weird um, rabbit holes and strange workings of the human mind and all that kind of stuff, I agree with them. Like from, you know, just having a casual interest in uh, mass murder, um, yeah, they all do hop back to Columbine and they all have this angry outlook that's like you know I want to be remembered for something and I want to go out with a bang that's the big one really like I totally appreciate how hypocritical this video <laughs> is coming off as but the thing is I think that having this kind of background knowledge that I already have in my head I can use that to kind of evidence some of the points that I'm trying to make about notoriety and the desire for it and the kind of background reasons why these things happen and I think huge 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 part of that is the desire for notoriety to be remembered to have your face splashed across the newspapers and also that association with a place as well so there are certain things that like you cannot think of Littleton, Colorado, for example, without thinking about the Columbine Massacre. You can't think about Sandy Hook without thinking about another shooter who I'm not going to name um, because we should stop, stop talking about them and giving them that platform and that reach to spread their message as well. And a lot of them with these manifestos, like... <sighs> I guess since the advent of the kind of modern internet like it's been very easy for people to just tell the world what they have in their head like oh you know here's a just live stream of all of my thoughts and then they go on to do something horrible and then people will use their writings or their videos as a justification for the murders that they've committed for example, in the involuntary celibate community, there is a particularly famous monster. 
um, who made videos, who like sat there in his car and like I've seen them a million times and yes, I've read the manifesto and yes, it's equally wank. Um, <laughs> but, you know, talking about women and like how he deserves women to sleep with him because he's such a nice guy. And then he goes on to like murder a bunch of women. Um, but people who have that mindset, who think like him, are gonna read the things that he wrote and listen to the things that he said and be like, yes, that's true. That's how I feel too. And you murdered people and now you're a god. So if I murder people, then I'm gonna be a god too. And it's this like vicious cycle, which is why <laughs> I wholeheartedly support the No Notoriety Initiative. And that is why this video that you're watching right now will be the only video on my channel that focuses on mass killings. You know, maybe in future videos, there'll be a narrative where a mass shooting will be mentioned in passing. Like I'm not saying I'll never ever ever mention it again, but I will never do a video focusing on a mass shooting or a mass shooter or the things that were going on inside their strange little heads because it's all the same. It's anger and the desire to be famous. So that about concludes today's video. Um, thank you so much for watching. Please do Give this video a thumbs up, continue the conversation down in the comments and please do subscribe if you're not already and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.